I must admit to you there are just several thoughts that flood my mind when I come to a text like this. And um, it is questions that I, uh, I bring to my Bible study, I assume you bring to yours. Uh, my experience in church life has proven that we do not practice this text. The first thing that jumped out at me is, what in the world am I supposed to approach another Christian about? Because <laughs> I must admit, I've been approached for a lot of stuff through the years by sincere Christians. Uh, one, well, I remember one person in Lubbock said, uh, uh, Pastor Bob, uh, your car is old and doesn't look attractive, and a pastor shouldn't drive a car like that. <laughs> I've been told how to dress how to speak, what to say, what not to say, where to go, what not to go, by sincere Christians, and they can just burp. I mean, it's none of their, much, much that I hear from God's people is not at all what this is talking about. We need to keep our bony fingers off each other. And, uh, you know, I ask, what, what am I supposed to approach somebody over? That's the first question. The second question is the attitude that often comes with church discipline. Um, This certainly is some godly guidelines for how do we deal with someone who has fallen into sin. But the attitude we approach them with is crucial. If we come with a self-righteous, condescending attitude, we've already lost the purpose of this text. I want to remind you that the purpose of church discipline or personal care for another is always Loving restoration. Loving restoration. The next thought that comes to my mind. I'm sure you remember the the singing group that used to to come to churches. Um, I had their name in my mind and it just, Continental Singers. (laughs) My synapse is sometimes short. Um, They have a song that they've sung. I've heard no one else sing it. And um, it's a song that kind of addresses, addresses this. One of, the, one of the lines in it, and I've forgotten all of it, Bruce, but uh, don't let a wounded soldier die. It's been my experience in the Baptist church that we shoot our wounded. Absolutely shoot them. We do not know the word restoration. We do not know the word forgiveness. Uh, we do not know the word quit telling And we do take things that people have done, inappropriate things, obviously out of the will of God things, and use them over and over as a way to make ourselves look better, at least in our own minds. Now, I want to tell you, I have become fully convinced that when God forgives, God forgets. And that would be a pretty good exercise for the people of God. Now, please know that I am not talking about covering up sin at any level. I'm not talking about sweeping it under the carpet. I'm not talking about taking it lightly. But I am talking about that all of us are sinful. And if we throw rocks, every house in the church will be broken. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, you may not sin as openly, as violently, or as obviously as some. But all of us continue to struggle with sin. And all of us need a word of encouragement. I believe this text gives us some practical, godly, inspired guidelines on how to deal with this issue. And I hope you will prayerfully enter in with the discussion of this text. Now, I'm going to try to uh, bring to you the grammar, the history, the context of this passage. All the while praying, all the while praying, all the while praying. That the Spirit of God, at a level that your mind can understand and respond to, will will bring people, circumstances, and issues to mind. And that somehow in the midst of this short sermon, I know there's not one, just get over it, Will. Um, Brief sermon, that we can be convicted by God. Of how to treat each other. (laughs) 
Brethren, now you know Paul, whenever he uses the word brethren, he's transitioning to a new subject. It was especially important for a group like the Galatian Christians, and I hope you remember what uh, chapter 5, verse 15 and 26 were. These people were biting, eating, devouring, tearing each other up. And he calls, Paul calls them brothers. I guess when I come to a text like this, and there, there are Christians that are obviously acting inappropriately, and I'll talk about the, the possible historical issues of this, but I, I guess what comes to me again and again, and I, I pray that you would read that this afternoon when you get home, because I think to me it, it is absolutely the definitive New Testament guidelines on how we treat one another, is Romans 14, verse 1. <laughs> Through Romans 15, verse 13. 14, 1 through 15, 13. Which deals with two kinds of Christians. Eh? With what Paul calls, and I think it's rather pejorative. I wish he'd have picked another word. But Paul's inspired and Bob's not. So do what you want to, Paul. Um, weaker brothers and stronger brothers. And the weaker brothers have been damaged by their past and they're so afraid to offend God that they do not fully experience the freedom that Paul has been preaching in Galatians. But stronger brothers who see they have been fully forgiven and fully forgiven and forgotten, if they're not careful, they tend to use that freedom as a license or as a weapon against Christians who don't agree with them. So there is certainly a word for the strong Christian and certainly a word for the weak Christian. In a sense, this is a, a word to the strong Christian. And uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid how we characterize ourselves would probably show something of our misunderstanding of this whole category. But, brothers, if anyone, this is a third class conditional sentence, which means it is possible. Would you agree with me that it is always possible for the children of God to sin? Would you agree with me that temptation is around every corner for those who desire to be Christ-like? And would you agree with me that the closer you get to Christ, the more you see the sin in your own life? It is quite possible for baby and peripheral Christians to live a life without a sense of conviction because of how far they are from Christ. But it is so difficult for those who seek with all effort to be like him and for him to recognize throughout the day that the shallowness and, and the inappropriateness, both commission and omission, of the things we should have and didn't do and the things we did do. Uh, the closer we draw, the more these problems come to our hearts and minds. And, and we have to face them. Now, the word uh, caught has been interesting to me. This is literally the Greek word surprised. Now, I, I do not want to take away from the responsibility of sin. I know in our day there is a trend to do that. It seems like that psychology in our day has made everything a disease. Everything. And the purpose of that is to take away the responsibility. Now, I, I, I am all for the addictive personality in every area to be given a chance to recoup. But I can't, as a biblical a teacher take away the consequences that come from choices. There are consequences. There are consequences. And you do have a choice. Yes, we are influenced by our culture. Yes, we are influenced by our personality. Yes, we are influenced by a personal force of evil out to hurt us and thereby hurt God. Yes, all of these are true. But we are still responsible for our choices. So if we find a brother and sister who is surprised... At a, this is not premeditated sin here. This is not open-eyed rebellion here. This, we're not talking about that. There are other texts on that. This is the, the Christian who in living life is somewhat surprised at the situation and circumstances they find themselves in. What do we do with that person? What do, how do we treat that person? Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, it does not define the trespass. You who are spiritual. Now, here's my problem. How do I define you who are spiritual? Because that is not an easy task. Because we are certainly not talking about sinlessness. Amen? There are no sinless believers. There are none. So, how would we characterize a spirit, you who are spiritual? Well, let's look at the book of Galatians itself. If you'll turn back, I'm not going to read it. 
to chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Uh, There is a description of a a spiritual Christian. If you look at the fruit of the Spirit, uh, which is just earlier uh, uh, than chapter 6, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, the fruit of the Spirit. These are the characteristics of the kind of person we're talking about. Not sinless. Um, May I say it's a person who has the mind of Christ? May I say it's the person who has a servant's heart? May I I say it's the person who has a shepherd's care? And I'm not talking about the office of pastor here. Uh, Those who see a brother in need and feel for that brother in Christ. this This is the kind of person we're talking to. And they're all kind of warnings for this person. Now, be careful when you go to others that you're not tempted yourself. Be careful that you don't find yourself in the same situation. These are all the warnings that come to the spiritual person. So we're not talking about the super Christian here because there are no super Christians. But we are talking about those who have the scriptural knowledge, the commitment to Christ likeness, and a track record of godliness to step into an erring brother's life erring sister's life with credibility, with compassion. Um, That's the person we're talking about. And then it says restore such a one. Now this is a present imperative. This is an ongoing, continual, daily command. Now this is not an option. And this is where I feel so uncomfortable. And, And I feel uncomfortable Because I'm a part of the evangelical community. And for us, if it feels good, it's a sin. The radio station you listen to. We don't spit, dance, or chew. You can't say those words in church. I mean, you can't dress that way. Oh, my soul. How many many cultural rules do we have that we try to pass on to other Christians as if that were the gospel? If that was a biblical mandate? We're commanded to restore. But what do I restore about? What do I pay the price, both emotionally and biblically? What what exactly do I intervene over? If I had to answer that question, and I can, of course, but if I had to try contextually, it would first have to do with the false teachers, who is the background to the book of Galatians. Then it would have to do to the attitude with which these church members are treating each other, back from chapter 515 and 526. And then it would be the list of sins, uh, uh, the obvious sins that come in chapter 5, the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit, which seem to be part of pagan worship practices, uh, immorality, uh, drunkenness, uh, those kinds of list of things. This has got to be the kinds of things we're talking about. In our day, in a a society of individual freedoms, where many times we don't even know the person next door or talk to them much, uh, what do we step into the life of a Christian about? Because in our day, all you do, if you have a conflict at First Baptist, you go to Second Baptist. And when the conflict popped up there, you go to Third, and then to Calvary, and then to Emmanuel. How How many churches are there in town? So it's, it's very difficult. I, I guess as a Christian leader, this is what I would say to you. Particularly those who are well known in the community, particularly those who are also leaders of the church. If there is an obvious sin in the life of those kind of people that is bringing reproach on the church of Jesus Christ, we must step in in love. Because... the. The reputation of the church of Jesus Christ has to be more important than our personal opinions. And this is where I would even go so far, and I hope you hear my heart on this. Even the appearance of evil is something we have to flee in the church of Jesus Christ. So therefore, even if I'm not sure that there is fire, smoke causes me to step in in love. And it steps in in love in such a way as not to condemn but step in such a way as to clear the smoke so that others can see the body of Christ with clarity. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? I want to say it again, and I want to say it as strong as I know how. The goal of Christianity is not about you. 
that you get to go to heaven, that you get to be wealthy, that you get to be healthy, that you get to choose and direct your own life. The goal of Christianity is the health and growth of the body of Christ. Every intent and resource and energy must be given to the health and growth of the body in Christ likeness. Now, brothers, that is so far from the I get to choose. It's my life. I'll live it. This is America. I get to do my own thing. When you accepted Christ, you died to individual choice. And now you are a bond slave of Jesus Christ. You have been bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. (laughs) We are not our own. And when we step into an erring brother's life, we step in with that humility and that concern for the corporate image and the corporate good and the corporate whole. It's so hard to try to to say this to an American church because you do not understand what I'm saying. If I was in other parts of the world where family and tribe and, and, and a, a language group is a real issue, they would understand immediately what I'm talking about, as would anybody from an eastern country. But Americans are so far removed from that corporate mindset that, that uh, messages like this uh, tend to be difficult for them. Um, Looking for, to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Now, there are, two, there are two words in Greek that are translated tempted, try, or test. One means to tempt or try or test to destruction. The other means to tempt or try or test to strengthen. It's a metallurgy term. Both of these words are used in these five verses. This is the one to tempt and try to destruction. This is the one that was used of what Satan did to Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Uh, this is the tempt so as to destroy. Now what we have, if you, look, if you just remember these few verses, we have an erring person that's in danger of hurting the body of Christ. And we even have a spiritual person that if they act in an inappropriate way or if they're self-deceived, are smoke blinded are also going to hurt the corporate good. So we've got two directions for this warning. Take an eye to the wounded one and take an eye to the healer. <laughs> because there's danger for both. There's danger for both because we're, we're entering into the, the ministry of God in forgiveness, healing, and restoration. And we have to enter it with great humility. And when we sin, we have to realize we need to be restored. I often say, some of my most uncomfortable moments is when people have testimony services. Thank God we don't have them more often. And everybody wants to confess somebody else's sin. The sin of a spouse, the sin of a child, the sin of a neighbor. Man, I get nervous about that. I do, because I I had a professor one time at Southwestern said... um, Talking about confession, he said, confession is the vomit of the soul. Be careful where you put it. I would agree with that. I have this. This is, this is Bob, not Bible. As a pastor through these years, if a sin is such that it infects and hurts the church, confession must be public to the church. If the sin is such that it affects another Confession needs to be to another. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We limit the exposure to those damaged. And everything, we do not need to put our dirty laundry in front of the whole community and world, which often happens in church life. Because the truth is the world will use it not in forgiving ways, but in condemning ways. There's a danger here. We got the one who goes to help must always look out for the evil one taking advantage even of a good intent. Notice verse 2. Bear one another's burden. Now, this is what, this is where Romans 14.1 always grabs me. Because I do feel like a mature Christian. I have really been freed. But I must use my freedom 
to serve, not a freedom to do. And Romans 14.1 says, Receive, accept, welcome, weaker brothers, without disputing doubtful points. Which means that my acceptance is not based on them agreeing with me or me trying subconsciously to get them to agree with me. I accept them because of who they are in Jesus Christ and who I am in Jesus Christ. I am simply acting as a representative, an under-shepherd of the King of Kings at that point. And this is not just to pastors. This is to any Christian who chooses to reach out in love to those who are hurt, to those who are damaged, to those who are wounded. Now, we tend not to do that because we don't know what to say. We don't want to get involved. Usually, it's just our tongues that do it behind people's back. But what we need to do is to reach out in real forgiving love that surrounds a wounded person and walks with a wounded person and prays for a wounded person and and surrounds that person for as long as they need to be surrounded so they can walk on their own again for the kingdom. I've just seen just the opposite so much in church. It is so painful for me to even talk about this because the damage that we have done to one another If we could just, as a church, say, God, First Baptist Monroe is going to be a church that reaches out to wounded Christians within five miles. Just wounded Christians who've been hurt and damaged by the people of God. We 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 couldn't have enough services on Sunday morning to fill this building over and over and over with Christians who feel cut off, isolated, have no place of worship. No place of service. No place of forgiveness. And yet we, we sit in our self-righteousness when all of us deserve condemnation for our acts, known and unknown. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Um, James is the one who takes this and, and has kind of like a the message, this is, this is James' expansion of the phrase, the law of Christ. This is how James calls it. This is James 1.25. The flawless law that makes men free. This is James 2.8. The royal law. This is James 2.12. The law of liberty. There is a law. I mean, I'm not trying to say there's not rules. Of course there's rules. I often feel like, though, the rules that we beat each other up with or 20th century Baptist rules, not 1st century biblical rules. So let's define the rules, but more important than the rules is the attitude. I remember in college a brother came to me and said, "Um, I don't like you. I've never liked you. But I want you to forgive me. I never dreamed I'd Rub that brother the wrong way that bad. Never dreamed. But him doing that opened a door for him and I to be friends through these decades. <laughs> Just opened the door. In a marvelous way. Nothing else could have done that. I never would have known that. He never, he never would have got it off his heart unless it had said it to me. It's very hard to do. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, this is a first class conditional sentence. This is assumed to be true to the author's intentionality, which means he's assuming there are people in the Galatian churches who think they're something. There are people in every church who think they're something. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) Every church I've been to, and uh, there's the problem. And notice number three. I I put a note by this. It says he deceives himself. There is nothing worse than than putting out your own eyes. Nothing worse than self-imposed blindness. And yet, how often we do it to make ourselves look better. But let each one must examine his own work. Now, this is the other word. This is the word examine, used to test or try with a view toward strengthening. You mean I am to test my attitudes and actions by what? The word of God, the fruit of the Spirit. 
the law of love. Yes, I am to test my actions and motives and thoughts and deeds. And if I do, I'll, I'll be stronger in it. If I do, I'll protect myself from the satanic temptation of self-righteousness, which may be the sin of the people of God. The other thing, and um, I, it, it was in that message translation. I don't see where Bill went. You know, he always leaves when the hard sermons come, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, security, that's it. Yeah, and I'm nervous about that too, so... Uh, <laughs> The whole, the whole purpose here about examining oneself is that we don't compare ourselves. Now, brothers, I guess my illustration on this. Do you remember uh, uh, Peggy Fleming? Do you know that name, Peggy Fleming? She was a wonderful ice skater years ago. And um, I guess what impressed me is one of the Olympics. She had won one of the Olympics. And a, a, a commentator asked her, how long have you been skating and how long do you practice? Now, she was about 20, early 20s. And she said, I have been skating since I was eight years old. And I practice every day for eight hours. Now, she was the greatest ice skater, woman ice skater of her age, but only for about three or four years. Because the body is such, you can't be the greatest ice skater longer than three or four years. You can't be the best wide receiver for more than three or four or five years. The body says that. You could be the best at something in the church that anybody has ever been, but you can't stay that. And if, if the minute we allow ourselves to start comparing ourselves and judging ourselves with one another, here's the damage. There's always someone we perceive as better. And there's always someone we perceive as lesser. Both of those will kill you. Both of those are performance Christianity. Both of those are making ourselves feel good at someone else's expense, are never being able to feel good because we're not the best. It'll kill you. You have a gift. This church needs your gift. Whether, you, whether you're the best of, the gift, of that kind of gift ever given, that's not the issue. You have a gift. You need to know that you are called by Jesus Christ, equipped by Jesus Christ, to serve the body of Christ that he has put you in for as long as you live. And that's the end of that story. So what you do, how you do it, how often you do it, are you better than anybody else? These are not questions that the corporate understanding of the body of Christ asks. Don't compare yourself. You'll never be happy if you compare yourself. You'll never be happy. Uh, verse 5, and, and I'm through. But each of you must bear his own load. Now, some have said we're supposed to bear our brother's burdens, and now it says bear your own burden. It looks like a contradiction between uh, verse 2 and verse 5. It's two different Greek words. The first Greek word is to overload a donkey so as that donkey to break down. Load it so much the donkey can't walk. We're to unload that donkey so that donkey can get up again. That's the Christian we go to help. The second word is a soldier's backpack. That, have you seen those soldiers on TV that carry those 60, 80 pound backpacks? They've got a sleeping bag. They've got medicine. They've got food. They've got different kind of weapons. They've got ammunition. Everything they need to survive out there in every situation is in that backpack. We as believers ought to prepare a backpack. You talk about up north, you know, they say, get, put this in your trunk of your car in case you get stalled. It's an emergency kit. We need an emergency Christian help kit that we knowingly, purposefully, daily, intentionally pack and put on our backs as we start out every morning. And in that backpack is the word of God. Prayer. Fruit of the spirit. Loving one another. They're in that backpack. And no matter what comes up during the day, what we need is in that backpack. <laughs> but what we do is run out of the house spiritually naked to prepare for a battle that's coming in every interpersonal relationship. Totally unaware of the battle, totally unequipped to help and love. And wonder why the church is weak and anemic. I, I pray that as we have spoken, something has come to your mind. A person... An event. And that somehow now, in this moment of invitation, you will say in your own heart, Lord, I need to address that issue. I need to write that letter. I need to make that phone call. 
I need to make that visit. I will, God, I will be available to love those who are wounded and broken and hurt and damaged. God, I'll be available. I'll be available for those in my family. I'll be available for those in my Sunday school class. I'll be available for those who I know about in the community who are your people who've been damaged and hurt. I'll be available, Lord. Will you, can you hear the Spirit of God speaking through me? Now the issue is availability. Not how, not when, not who, not what for. Availability. To be the hand of Christ in the life of a brother or sister. The hand of Christ in the life of a brother or sister. May we pray. Lord, the Bible is not an individual book. It's a corporate book. It's about a family that's come to know you. And everybody in the family is broken. And everybody in the family is in need. And everybody in the family is in process. And everybody in the family is gifted and called minister. And the battle rages. And there have been, there, there have been some casualties. And there's been some wounded. And I pray that we would... Um, Man the field hospital for the kingdom. That we would be available to be the loving, forgiving, restoring hands, feet, and mouth of a wounded Savior for wounded people. Forgive us for our comparisons and our claims to self-righteousness. Forgive us for our set of rules by which we judge others. We pray for your presence. We pray for your love. We pray there's an odor about our lives that's pleasing to you and attractive to the world. 